So today we're gonna talk about, as I said, it's sort of a, a sort of more uh, forward-looking topic on sort of automated database management systems or you know, work we've been doing here at Carnegie Mellon. In particular, we focus on what are called self-driving database management systems. Before we get into that, uh, real quickly, I just wanna go over the, again, I talked about this last class, but here's what's remaining for us in the semester. So I'm lame and didn't print it out, uh, but I'll post it on Piazza later tonight. Um, but it's it's basically going to be pick your favorite paper and, and write a you know a, a short synopsis of why why or why not you think it could fit into the system we're building here. Okay. All right, and then on uh, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, then, well, yeah. All right. In a good way or a bad way? Good. Interesting is good. Okay, so um, the all right. So then the, the Anil is coming on on Wednesday in class to give give a guest lecture. So again, he'll be talking about the Hana system, um, and he, that he, he he his background was he worked on Sybase up in Canada, did his PhD at Waterloo, and then Sybase got bought by SAP, and they transitioned over to um, to work on Hana. But he can answer, you know, if you have questions about Sybase, the old school stuff, or the newer stuff, he can answer both of them, which I find is super fascinating. And then this is the stuff that you still have to do for the final project. Code review coming up. Uh, the final presentation will be on May 6th. Again, we'll meet at 9 a.m. I'll send an announcement for that. Uh, our friends and database companies are sending you guys t-shirts. Everyone gets a free, everyone gets a database group t-shirt. Or, I'm sorry, everyone gets a database shirt, not necessarily from the CMU database group, but Pick your favorite database company, and we'll have shirts available for everyone. Okay, and I know some of you guys uh, are interested in TidyB because they're the Chinese database company. They're sending us shirts. Like they contacted them this weekend, so we'll have Chinese database company shirts as well. Okay, and then we'll do the code review drop. So the code review will do the eleventh, and then the final uh, code drop will be on May fourteenth because I have to get grades in. I think by the fifteenth or the sixteenth. Okay, because some of you are graduating. All right, any questions about any of this? Boom. Final code drop doesn't have to be the same as the final code review. They're different. So the final code drop is like you you giving me yeah. like the final design document. You you've uh, addressed all of the concerns and comments in the reviews. But like there can still be new functionality or features added after the review. Yes, okay. that's a bold move. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to do that, sure. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so today's agenda, again, I, I want to start off talking about, uh, I want to start off talking about what people have been doing in the space of autonomous database systems, right? You know, self-driving is the buzzword that people are using now because of self-driving cars, but people have been doing this for 45, 50 years, or at least trying to. So we want to understand what people have tried in the past, and then we can then see what's different about what we're trying to do, in, you know, in, in, in the modern era. Um, and then we'll talk about the paper you guys read, which is basically a survey or overview of engineering guidelines for how to build a data center system so that in the future it could be self-driving. And these are things that we've come across and we've learned from building our own system here. And part of the reason why we threw Peloton away and started over was because of some of those things you, we read in that paper were like, when you start trying to do the machine learning stuff on, on the code base we had before, it was just not possible because of the you know the the, the way this, the system was originally written, and then I briefly want to talk about the so the other major trend in the in in sort of applying machine learning to database systems is what are these called these learn components where you know, instead of learning using heuristics to make decisions you you learn some model that can that can tell you what to do, okay. All right, so why are we spending time talking about this, right? Why do we actually want to automate and uh, you know the management of the database system? So the, you know, we, I've talked about the, throughout the entire semester that if you are able to work on the internals of a database management system, that you can get paid lots of money and go anywhere you want to go, you know, help build these things because they, you know, this is a skill that's in demand. Um, and so not only can you get make a lot of money building database systems, but actually you can get a lot of money, you can make a lot of money maintaining them, right, as, as a DBA or database administrator. So when, you, when there, was, there was a survey done about 10 years ago about where the people are spending money when they install a new database system. Like, so now again, we're not talking about actually building the internals. We're talking about like, if I'm a, if I'm a company, 
and I'm selling widgets, and I need to set up a database system, how much is it going to cost me to set that database up? So in the survey, they found about the personnel was accounted for about 50% of the total cost of ownership of a database management system. So the TOC is, is like, it's like, what is, it, what, is, what is the total cost of me actually deploying this database? So it's not just if I pay Oracle or IBM or Microsoft for the license of the software. It's like, you know, the, the cost of the machines I had to buy, the time I had to spend setting up those machines, setting up the software, the energy it uses, I have to use to, to run those machines, and then also the, 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 the labor cost for having humans basically maintain the software and administer it, right, the DBAs. And these people get paid a lot of money. So the average salary in 2017, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics from the, from the federal government, was around $90,000 a year. Um, I would say that this, again, this is the average across the entire United States. I've heard some crazy numbers on the East Coast and the West Coast, especially in, in New York City for, for, for the financial guys. Right? We're talking like six figures. And I remember when I was in grad school, my, uh, my advisor got a call from a hedge fund in Connecticut, and they were looking for a DBA that did sort of high, transac high performance transaction processing or stream processing systems, and they wanted to pay that person half a million dollars a year to, to manage software, right? So the humans are expensive, uh, and they don't scale, meaning like if I have, you know, you know, not just my one database instance, if I have thousands or tens of thousands, there's no way any human can actually manage all those individual pieces of, you know, of software. Right? Typically what they do is they try to figure out what's the lowest common denominator, how to configure the system, and then they just replicate that over and over again. Right? So Oracle and Microsoft and, 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 and Amazon, they're not tuning each every you know, individual instance of, of RDS or Aurora or Redshift. Right? They are, you know, they'll come up with a basic configuration, but they sort of leave the, 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 the nitty-gritty details of how to actually set up the schema and things like that. They leave that to the humans. Right? And of course, again, it's expensive. So people recognized in the early days of database management systems, especially relational database management systems, when you had this abstraction layer between the logical configuration of the database, the schema and the queries, versus the actual physical organization of the data and the execution of those queries. Like, since we're decoupling those things, right, it was assumed that the data system would be smart enough to be able to figure out the optimal way to configure the system. So people, have, people recognized in the early you know, 1970s that, oh, we had this issue where like, if we need to be able to figure these things out automatically, uh, how are we actually going to do this to get the best performance? So what's different, though, is from what we're going to talk about today, is, and at a high level, it's essentially the same. Uh, it's just they come up with a different label or different terms over, over the various decades. So going back to the 1970s, again, with the first relational database management systems, the buzzword of the term at the time was called self-adaptive systems, so self-adaptive databases. And so these early systems were focused on, or tools, were focused on solving what are called physical design problems, or physical database design problems. Right, so the most classic one is picking indexes. Right? If I have a bunch of queries, uh, what indexes should I build to, to speed up those queries? They also were concerned about doing partitioning and sharding key selection. So I want to split up my tables across different, uh, to different you know, physical disk or different machines. How do I pick some attribute to split them up on? Whether I'm using range partitioning or hash partitioning, it doesn't matter. And that way, again, I, I get the best performance in my system. And then data placement is sort of you do after partitioning. So after I decide how to split up my, my, my table into partitions, where do I actually physically store them? So at a high level, these early tools work the same way that, that the tools work now. It's just the, you know, now we're doing machine learning stuff, you know, the machine learning magic to make this all work. So the way it basically works is that you have some human DBA, and they're going to prepare a, a sample workload trace comprised of the queries that the application executed, right? And, and in our case, it's going to just be the SQL statements that the, the, the application submitted to the database system. And let's say in this example here, we want to, we want to have a tool, a self-adaptive tool that, that can pick indexes for us. So what we need to do is we need to then feed this, this, this training data, this, this workload sample, into our tuning algorithm. And then this is going to do some kind of computation on the workload trace and try to derive some information about how the queries are accessing the data. So and the most simple, simple way to do this would be, in this case here, if I'm trying to pick an index, I just count the number of queries that touch each column. Right? I, I can build a histogram for that. 
And then this internal tool is going to have its, this, this tuning algorithm is going to have its own internal cost model that's going to try to, 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 to figure out what indexes could actually matter to be, right? And come up with a bunch of candidate choices. And then it uses that internal cost model to be able to say, you know, this one will provide me some greater benefit than another one, right? Of all the possible choices I could have for what index to build, I know that this one's going to help me the most. So then these tools then spit out that, that information, that selection as a recommendation to the human. But it's up for a human to then take that recommendation and then actually apply it to the database system. And of course, this is where the, you know, this sort of like this disconnect between what the tool says and what the human actually needs to know about how to deploy it. Right? So it's not enough just to say, like, I looked at my query trace from the past, and I think this index is going to help me. The, the human also needs to reason about, well, what's the right time to deploy this action? What time is the right time to build the index? I know my demand is low at Sunday morning at 3 a.m., so that's when I'll go build and reoptimize all my indexes. They also need to be aware of what the workload trend is because maybe the sample workload trace I gave it was for you know some some low point in my in my in, you know in, during the year and the types of queries I'm executing at that time you know are going to look a lot different as I get closer to the holidays all right when maybe doing more updates and therefore I want to I know I want another di different set of indexes so even though this algorithm can figure out based on the workload trace you gave it what was the best index there's a bunch of extra extra information that the human has to reason about to make decisions about whether this recommendation was correct or not. Then the human also needs to, to, to reason over time, uh, has my workload changed enough where the recommendation in the past still makes sense now? Because you know, the, the best index today might not be the best index for tomorrow. And these tools can't handle that. So just to give you an idea, just to again, emphasize about people have been thinking about this problem for a long, long time. Uh, one of the earliest papers on doing self-adaptive databases with index, index selection for self-adaptive databases was in Sigma, written in 1976. And actually, this was written by my advisor and advisor, who's dead, right? So again, people have been doing this for a long time. And actually, the guy's name was Michael Hammer. His daughter is Jessica Hammer in HCI. She's a professor over there, right? Um, so small world, I suppose. All right. so. So this was for index selection, but partitioning, sharding keys, uh, the, the data placement. At a high level, they all work the same way, right? There's some internal cost model that you that you use that you derive from the, the sample workload trace, and you use some kind of algorithm, some kind of search to, to make a decision. So then we entered the era of the in the 1990s. Instead of calling self adaptive databases, they were now called self tuning databases. But at a high level, they still work the same way. You prepare a workload trace, you feed it to an algorithm, the algorithm then crunches on it and spits, back, spits out a recommendation, and it's up for a human to decide whether that, that recommendation was a good idea or not. The one thing, though, that, uh, that was different, um, that sort of was a, a big breakthrough in this, in this era, came out of the Microsoft Auto Admin Project. So Microsoft in the early 2000s, for like a 10, 15 year period, they were sort of at the vanguard of doing automated you know, database optimizations. And it all came out at, at this auto admin project. So they were doing like index selection, sharding keys, materialized views, a whole, whole bunch of other things. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. So one of the key contributions that they came up with was instead of having the database, the, sorry, the tuning algorithm have its own internal cost model to try to, 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 try to figure out you know, what was a, you know, a, a, a good choice of an index, they could just actually leverage the, the, the data system's built-in optimizer's cost model, the things we talked about in the last lecture, and use that to then figure out what indexes actually are going to make sense. Right? And the reason why they did this was because there, otherwise this, this, there, there would be this disconnect between what the tuning algorithm thought was a good index and what the data system thought was a good index. Right? I may end up saying, oh, I think this index on AB is a really good idea, and therefore recommend that. But then when you actually run the real queries, the optimizer is like, that's garbage. I don't want that at all. Right? So, so by leveraging what's inside of this thing, right, it's essentially doing the same thing, trying to determine like, what, you know, what indexes would I pick for my diff different queries. And so rather than, than re reinventing the wheel in, over here, you just use, use that. Um, so there's a great uh, paper from uh, Serge Chaudhry. Uh, from 2007, so it's called the, the Self-Tuning Data Systems, a, a Decade of Progress. So this is a retrospective of the work they did over a 10-year period all in the space, and this sort of covers the main, 
right? The, 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 the main problems of trying to do automated uh, database tuning and database design. The, so, in, so again, so they were, in the self-tuned databases, they were doing the same things that the self-adaptive systems were doing. So index selection, partitioning keys, and data placement. But the other thing that these guys also worried about was doing knob configuration. So a, a, a knob would be like a, a, a configuration parameter you can set in the system to control its, its, its runtime behavior, like a, like a cache size or, or, or a buffer replacement policy algorithm, right? things that you can then tune as, as a human. And so, so part of the reason why this, this knob configuration tuning problem came to the forefront in the self-tuning database era is that the complexity of these systems actually increased quite a bit. So this is a survey of uh, that my PhD student Dana Van Aken did uh, a year or two ago, where she just looked at a 15-year history of the releases from uh, from Postgres and MySQL, and then for every single release, she just went and counted the number of configuration knobs that they had. So at the very beginning, in like 2001, they had you know uh, Postgres had 53, MySQL had had 75, but then after 15 years, MySQL's up to 540, and Postgres is at uh, 291. So Postgres had a 5x increase, MySQL had a 7x increase. And so not all these knobs affect the system with the same, have the same impact on the performance of the system, um, but it's certainly at, at this scale, this is well beyond what humans can reason about, right? Because these knobs are uh, also not independent. Like if you set one, then that can change the effect of another knob, right? And then the um, and so trying to figure out what's the right combination of, of these different knobs can be really hard. And you have to do this on a per application basis. So this is what I was saying. What oftentimes what happens is in really large fleets, they sort of come up with a best case configuration uh, or settings for these knobs. And they just use that for all their installations, even though you know, they could be tuning it on a per application basis and get, you know, get better hardware utilization and get better performance. There's nobody does that because it's just way too complex for humans. All right, so then we hit the era uh, that we're sort of at today in the, in, in the, the 2010s, um, where now we have sort of these cloud-managed databases. So at this point, with the rare exception actually of, of Microsoft, who just announced, uh, they have a paper out this year where they can do automatic index, index tuning for, for databases on uh, SQL Azure in the cloud. Other than that, and Oracle's self-driving data, so we'll talk about in a second, but none of the major database vendors uh, on the cloud are doing any uh, per application or per database installation tuning. They're all doing automation at the like the service provider level, so like a tenant placement and 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 uh, and migration. So they're trying to figure out as a cloud provider where to actually store or run your your database installation across their giant fleet. And it's essentially a, a bin packing problem. Right? I have a bunch of customers, I have a bunch of machines, and I want to figure out you know, what's the minimum number of machines I need to, to, to service all of my tenants. Again, you as the customer don't see this because you don't know what machine your, your database is running on anyway. It's all virtualized from you. But they're doing this underneath the covers using machine learning and other techniques to, to, to sort of automate this to make their lives easier. But again, other than the, the SQL Server example that I said, like nobody's actually tuning each individual installation, right? They're using a sort of a best case scenario. So given I just spent the last 15 minutes talking about uh, sort of automated, automated database management from the last 45 years, why is this all insufficient? Why, why don't we have a fully autonomous database system today, right? And why is this something that I'm spending my time worrying about? And I would say that there's, there's three major issues, or three major um, problems with this previous work. So the first is that, with the exception of the cloud stuff that I talked about at the end, uh, in all these scenarios, they, they were essentially, the, the, the tools were recommendation, providing recommendations. And a human had to still make a final value judgment about whether the recommendations that the tool generated was a good idea. Then they also had to know when was the right time to, to deploy it, right, to build that index or, or move data around and then observe the changes over time to determine whether the, the application has changed enough, or the data has changed enough, where choices in the past that were good are now bad. Right, so there's still a human in the loop that has to figure all these things out for you, or has to, to make it all work. The second is that they're all reactionary measures, meaning 
I, they're only solving problems that occurred in the past, and they're not sort of looking in the future and saying, what's coming down the road, and let me go ahead and, and prepare myself accordingly. So I showed you the, in, in the sort of the simple example of index selection, I gave the, the tool a workload trace of queries I've executed in the past. So if my queries are running slow in the past, uh, you know, that's the only thing it knows about. It can, can reason about that workload trace and try to pick indexes to help you. But it doesn't know that tomorrow my workload is going to change or the, the workload pattern is going to shift. And therefore, I need to build maybe another set of indexes or choose other different options to, to optimize itself. Right? It only looks at things that, that occurred behind you. So the way to sort of think about this in the context of a self-driving car is like the self-driving car can only look behind it. It can't look ahead in the road. So it can see all like the children it ran over, right? But it can't see the ones in front of it, <laughs> all right? And again, he, humans, humans handle this, right? For Singles Day or Black Friday, they know it's coming because it's on the calendar, it's circled. So they go ahead, prepare the database system accordingly, right? You know, weeks, weeks ahead. These tools don't know anything about this. And the last one is a bit more nuanced, but the way to uh, think about transfer learning is that Every single database installation is uh, with some, there's some rare examples in the newer stuff, but at least in all the examples I showed here, they were always treating the database as sort of a, a, an island by itself and only reasoning about how to optimize uh, you know, just that single database instance. And there's nothing that they learn about optimizing that instance that they then apply to optimize other instances. So if I come along uh, today and I have my, my, my one database instance and I use these tools to optimize it, I come along tomorrow with a different database that looks slightly different, has a different set of queries, the tools don't know anything, can't apply anything they learned from the, from the first job and apply it to the second one. They're sort of starting from scratch each time. Now this is slightly changing, uh, again, some of my own research here tries to handle this. Um, things also get super hard too when you start dealing with variations in hardware and some of these algorithms we, we, we can talk about later. But the bottom line is, again, all of these tools assume that I, it was running a, a, a single job or single search to try to optimize your one database instance, and then tomorrow start all over again. So, all right, so now we, we say, all right, so if, if, if this is insufficient to build an automated database system, a, a system that's completely autonomous, how can we understand, well, what does it mean to actually have an, an autonomous system? And so the, the way I like to think about this, in, this, in the same way for self-driving cars, there's now this like industry standard to define the different levels of what it means for a car to be self-driving, a car to be autonomous, right? There's like, there's, I think there's like six levels, and it has to do with like, as you, as you increase the level, there's the, the human has to do less. Like the lowest level, there's no automation, the, the user has to drive everything, you know, control everything. At the highest level, there's like no steering wheel. You just tell the car where you want to go and it just takes you there. But then there's all these intermediate levels where you have to say, does the human have to have their hands on the wheel? Do they need to pay attention to the road? Can they watch movies in the back seat and not die, right? Um, and the part of the reason why they're trying to define these rules is because, you know, there's that guy, the, the Tesla guy down in the south somewhere, he was like, t wasn't paying attention to the road because the car was in autopilot mode. And it wasn't truly self-driving, and then he got killed. So we need to understand this in the context of a database system to say, uh, what's the level of autonomy that, we're, that the system could be providing so that humans can reason about how much they still need to be involved in the management of the system, right? So at the, the lowest level, what I call level zero, right, this is the, the manual level. Uh, this is where we have no autonomy, and it's essentially what we think about database, many databases today, where I have to tell the data system exactly everything I want to do. I have to tune the configuration knobs, I have to you know, build all, any indexes, if I want to do partitioning or scale up, scale out, all that has to be done manually. Right? The, 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 the database system is essentially a tool that does whatever I tell it to do. But then if you, now we start trying to include more, more levels of automation, the next level is that there's a is sort of a, 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 there's tools to, to assist the human with some of these some of these tasks. So in my example of the index recommendation tool or the you know, picking charting keys and things like that, they would fall into this category here, right? 
Yeah, I feed it some data, it crunches on it, it makes back recommendations, and then a human has to then reason about whether those recommendations were a good idea, when to apply them, and then to, to observe whether they're helping us over time. And I would say, that, again, this, this exists today. Like Microsoft Auto Admin would be an example of this. Then you start getting into more interesting things. Uh, so the next level would be what I call mixed management. Um, and the idea here is that the database system can manage some parts of the system automatically, and the human can still manage all the other parts as it, just as it could before. And then the, the, the sort of the two need to make sure that they don't trip over each other and, and, and you know, put the database in a, in a weird state. So in this case here, the, 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 the system always defers judgments, calls, or changes to the human. The, so if the human says, I want to do something, the and the data system says that you know its policy is saying I want to do something different. It always defers to the human. So this exists now in uh, for some some systems have some components support this kind of uh, operation. So Oracle has their call, it's called the self managing memory, and basically what happens is I tell it to figure out how to to, to allocate. The, the, the total amount of memory that's available to the system to different parts of, 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 of the, the database. So how much do I want to use for a query cache, for the buffer pool manager versus like a Java cache? They basically have some heuristics that look at how your application is accessing the, the database and it can have rules to assign you know, different allocation slices for, the, for that memory. Then we get into uh, what I call local optimization. So this gets a bit more advanced now, where you have uh, the subsystems in, in, the, in, the data, in the database can now adapt themselves without any human guidance. So, uh, so I'm trying to think of a good example. Of what this would be the so like the the in SQL Azure that that example where you can it, it'll automatically pick indexes for you if you if you let it do it. That's a good example of of something like this. Right, you just say, go figure this out for me, and, and it'll do it for you. The, the, the difference, though, is that there's no high-level uh, reasoning in the components about understanding how all the different parts of the system are working together. So if I have something, can, you have something that can automatically pick indexes, I can have something that can automatically manage memory, but they're not coordinating with each other to keep track of like, what decisions the, the, each of the two of them are making. Right? Still, a human has to then coordinate across all, all of them. The second and last level is called direct optimizations. And this is where the, the system is basically can almost manage itself, uh, but it's still going to rely on a human to provide it with high-level direction and hints about what to optimize. So you have to be able to tell the system, hey, Singles Day or, or Black Friday is coming, or Cyber Monday is coming up, Go ahead and start maybe thinking about how to pre-allocate itself or, or to scale out or scale up the, the resources. There are also maybe some cases where the, the data system will end up in a weird state and it says, I, I don't know how to optimize this, I can't make things better, and then it can call out to the human and ask for help. Again, not pushing the self-driving car metaphor too much, but this would be equivalent to the if you you know, some some self-driving car has been envisioned where you don't have to have your hands on the steering wheel. But if it's going to crash or something bad about to happen, it'll flash an alarm to wake the human up to say, you know, figure out what's going on. And of course, that, that could be bad because you might not, you might be in the back seat watching the movie, you might have time to get to the front and help the car, right? So it's, it's debatable whether, in terms of automobiles, whether this is a good idea. For, for, you know, for a database system, you know, how far, how close, how far along you, you can get down a bad path or configuration before you have to ask the human for help. Uh, you may, you know, screw the whole system up, and, and no human can actually be able to recover it. Like you, you put the car in a ditch. So figuring out how, at what point you need to go ask the human for help is is, is challenging. And so the last one is what again, what I'm focused on is is so we'll call self-driving database system, and this is where you have no human, uh, no interaction with the human at all. So the the long-term vision of how I think this would, could work is like. You just basically give the, the data system your credit card, uh, and then you just walk away, and it just does everything for you. Now, you may say, you know, Amazon can do that now, right? You just give Amazon your credit card, and they'll have fun with it and, and do everything for you. But it's um, underneath the covers, you know, there's, there's still humans, you know, in today's system, it's humans with stuff that manage it. So 
I'm defining a self-driving database system to be a, a database system that can, can, can deploy, configure, and tune itself automatically without any human intervention. So that means in both of terms of like figuring out what actions I want to apply. So an action would be like build an index, drop an index, change this knob, scale up, scale out, add, add more machines, things like that. So it can do all, it can figure out what actions to apply automatically without a human telling us anything. And that includes both how to solve issues in the past and prepare for issues in the future. Um, and then we, the way it basically works is that you tell it that this, I have some objective function or service level of uh, uh, requirement or agreement that says, I, I, you know, I need to have all my transactions complete in 50 milliseconds, or I need to be able to process a million transactions a second. You provide some, some, some higher level objective function and then applies these actions to try to figure out how to, how to go and do it. So it'll select actions automatically. It'll know when's the right time to apply them based on what my workload demand is, what the action is actually going to do, how long it's going to take to deploy the action, right? What changes, how is that, you know, how is that going to affect certain queries? And then after it applies the action, it's then able to observe the change that it made, learn something from it, hopefully, and then feed that information back into its models and refine its future decision-making processes. So the idea here is that we're sort of completing the loop that the, the earlier guys didn't have couldn't do, right? So they could do, you know, select the actions, or tell, tell you which ones to, you know, you want to choose, tell you which ones you want to apply to improve your objective function, but they couldn't tell you when to apply it, and they couldn't learn anything from after you, after you applied it, right? That's the sort of second half of the loop that's missing. So our goal in, in building a self-driving data system is to complete the whole thing. So again, I'm, being I'm going to be very vague here about the machine learning side of things just because this is the part that we're still working on and we don't have an answer for yet. But at a high level, we think the roadmap of the system we're building here looks like this. So you have the database management system and it's executing SQL queries for the application because this is what it normally does. And it's observing what happens when it actually runs these queries, like these internal metrics about like, how much CPU did I spend in this operator? How much memory did I use to do my sorting? So as it executes the queries, it then feeds that into this modeling component, which will build these internal models that try to forecast what the workload's gonna look like in the future. It tries to say, here's how much memory my, you know, my, my hash join is gonna take for queries that look like this, or my, or my database looks like that. We then feed these models we generate into a search and planning component, which then is gonna do some kind of search to figure out what actions are available to me to help me improve my objective function. What is my workload gonna look like in the future based on my forecasts? How will the system react to different changes in, in, in my you know, configuration based on the actions I apply? It's then going to choose some action or sequence of actions that they think is gonna have the, uh, the most benefit to the system's performance based on its objective function. It then takes the action that it selects, actually then go, goes ahead and deploys it, observes the change while, while it's, it's, it, the action is being deployed, then observes the change afterwards, and then repeats this whole process all over again. So I apply my actions, I continue to execute queries because that's what the application is asking us to do, and I observe whether, whether it's helping me or not, and I feed that back into my modeling phase. Right? So, what, again, what is different between what was done before? Uh, we need to know where to actually deploy our, our actions, right? What, what parts of the system should we target based on what our objective function looks like? Like if we, look, if we look like we're CPU bound, then maybe we want to choose optimizations that will be less expensive than CPU, but maybe use more memory. Um, we wanna know how to actually wanna deploy these. So, in all the other previous examples, I said, you know, the, the recommendation tool would say build this index. But it wouldn't tell you how many cores or threads you want to use to build the index, how aggressive you, you should be in it, where it should actually store the index, right? All that needs to happen here. And we already talked about uh, when to deploy. The why one is a bit more tricky and a bit more nuanced. Um, and the way to understand this is sort of like this idea of metacognition in machine learning, where Instead of having the tool or this, 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 this search and planning phase sort of be hard coded to say, I want to build an index because indexes are good. You want to be able to have the models sort of reason about their own learning processes so that it learns that indexes are good or learns why indexes are good, 
right? Oh, I have these queries that are accessing the, these 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 attributes, and indexes can help me. Therefore, I should build an index. Because then, if you if you can reason, if the models can reason about these higher level constructs, then now you can do that transfer learning thing where where you say, on this other system that had these queries that look completely different than the queries I have here. But I saw or I learned that building an index made things go better. So now for my new database installation, I have completely different queries, but I know about indexes and they can help, you know, help improve performance. So this one, I'm being very hand wavy on, but this is, this is eventually where we want to go. We're just not there yet. So again, is this, is this high level? This is clear, right? And what's going to be tricky about this, and we'll see some examples in a second, is like, we want to do this while the system's running. We don't want to have to have like our production server over here and then uh, a completely separate installation over here that just running a bunch of experiments all the time and, and trying to you know, figure out you know, the training these models. We want to have everything being done online with obviously without slowing down the, the, the regular database workload. But that's, that, that comes later. All right, so the, again, the paper that I had you guys read was this, uh, this, this publication that we, we've been working on here at, at CMU for, for about a half a year, a year now. Um, and it's design principles that we've uh, came up with as, you know, as building Peloton and as building the newer system to then, that we, where we know how we want to organize the architecture of the system to prepare itself, to prepare it to be, to be controlled by some kind of self-driving brain or pilot or, or component. So I, the, the, the design principles are broken up into three categories. And environment observations are how the data is going to collect either the, the, the workload trace from the, from the application or the internal metrics of the system to then train models that allow, allow them to reason about you know, what, what the performance of the system will be as it applies to actions. Then there's some metadata we want to maintain and expose to whatever's controlling the system in such a way that we can uh, reduce the, the, the number of stupid things or stupid configurations or bad configurations we have to consider in our models. And the last one is that how do we actually then take the actions that the planning components select and apply them in an efficient manner and then observe their changes and then be able to feed that back into our modeling. So the key idea throughout all of this that permeates you know, throughout the entire paper that hopefully was conveyed is that we're not just doing this for the sake of doing it so that it can be controlled by some kind of external system or you know, by some planning component. The goal really is to design the system in such a way that we reduce the amount of training data we, have, we potentially have to collect and we cut down on the size of the solution space we have to consider in our optimization algorithms. So the idea to make about this is like I, you know, for my tables, for a database, I could build an index on every possible combination of, uh, of columns that I have, but obviously I know that not all columns are going to be useful to me, or so not all index combinations are going to be useful to me. So if there's a way to reduce the number of potential solutions I, I have to consider, then that will potentially allow my algorithms to converge to a, you know optimal configuration more quickly. So that's, that's the high-level idea of, about, about all this engineering stuff. So we'll go through each of these one by one, and I'll show some, simple, some, some, some examples for some of these. So again, the first one is the, the environment ob observation. So the idea here is that this is just how we're going to record what's going on inside the data system as we execute queries, in addition to what queries we're ex executing. So data systems are, are actually a, um, with no surprise, they're very good at collecting data because that's what they're designed for, and so they're very good at collecting data about themselves. So every, every major database system has these things called metrics. Sometimes they're called statistics. Sometimes they're called um, um, events. But at a high level, they're, all, they're just recording what the system is actually doing on, on the inside. And they're designed in such a way <coughs> excuse me, to expose this information to humans so that can, humans can then reason about the, the behavior of the system. But a lot of it is, is, is unnecessary. A lot of this is, is, is redundant. And if we then feed that into our algorithms or, tra or trans train some models on top of that, not all that data is actually useful. So the right, so that's that's sort of the runtime metrics. So the the for the the workload history, this is also very common in existing systems where you can record workload traces 
of, that the application uh, you know, it submits to you. So I think in MySQL it's called the general log, sometimes it's called the query log, and in SQL Server it's called the, the event store. Right? Basically every single SQL query that somebody sends, you record in a, in a table or a log file what that was. But it's more than just recording what the SQL query was, you also need to record what was the execution context that, that, that where that query was invoked. So that means like what was the, you know, what was the isolation level that the, 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 the client was you know, executing the transaction under? What are some other configuration parameters the client may have set up? Right? You can have per session variables. So all those things you need to record in addition to the query as well as the result of the query. Right? Was, was it part of a transaction that got aborted? Why was it aborted? Right? All, the, all these you need to record because you're basically re going to replay that uh, later on. And so the reason why you need this and not just this is because this is abstracted away from the physical configuration of, of the database system and the hardware. So for these runtime metrics, as the system changes, like if I, if I start adding indexes, then these runtime metrics will change. Right? So say I have a runtime metric that, that counts the number of tuples I access per query. So if my table has a billion tuples and I don't have an index on it, then the runtime metrics will say per query you access a billion tuples. Then I come along and add an index, and now I only need to access, you know, log n, or you know, do log n reads. Then all the runtime metrics that I've collected in the past could potentially get invalidated, and I have to throw away all my training data and start over again if I'm basing all my models just on on, on this. So you need a combination of two of these because this one will, will be independent of how any action you deploy to optimize the system. The last one is the database contents. This one I don't have an answer for you because we don't know how to do it yet. But basically, I need to know what what did the database look like at a, at, a, at a particular snapshot in time for then for me to be able to reason about why queries performed a certain way. So let's say I have my workload history. I see that query that, that touched a billion tuples. Or sorry, I see the query that is a scan, sequential scan on an entire table. I see a runtime metric that says this tuple this this query touched uh, you know a thousand tuples. Then I see that same query again, and now I see it, it touches a billion tuples. Has the query changed, or has my configuration changed, or is it because the database contents have changed? So you need a combination of, of, all, of all these three things. So for runtime metrics, a really important thing uh, you have to worry about is to make sure that you expose all of the information about any subcomponents that you have in the system um, that you expose all the right metrics you need to be able to figure out what's actually going on for this. So I want to give an example of what I mean by this using, using RocksDB. Um, so this, this would be an example of, of not doing this correctly. Um, I've told the RocksDB guys about this. They, they said they're fixing it, but we haven't checked to see whether that actually happened. So RocksDB has the ability to set column families, uh, or set, set knob configurations per column family in a table. So think of a column family, it's, sort of, and it's like a partition. Right? And for each partition in the table, I can, I can tune them or configure them to be different in different ways. So each table can have multiple column families, and each column family in that table can be configured differently. So that's fine. Um, and they actually record statistics for, uh, for each individual column family, information about what, what it, uh, you know, you know, how many tables did it, you know, how much data, sorry, how many, how many compactions they did, the size of the column family, and so forth, right? So here I'm defining a new column family called default, and then over here, uh, sorry, I'm setting configuration for the column family called default, and then in here I can see that here's all the different metrics and, and their values. So this is RocksDB running in, in MySQL, which is called MyRocks. The problem with this, though, so they're, they're, they are exposing some metrics about the subcomponents, but the key thing we need is the number of reads and number of writes, because I need to know how much, uh, you know, how many times am I going to disk or, or, or writing from disk, uh, for this particular column family, because I can tune, you know, different policies that could affect that, you know, the, the disk usage. So the only way to get that information for a column family is if you go get the global stats, and now you see they've aggregated the, the bytes read, bytes written for all possible column families. So if, in order to say, now I need to be able to see a lot of sample data, or training data, to be able to extract out exactly what each individual column family actually did. Right? So in this case here, this is a bad example of what you don't want to do. You don't want to aggregate your metrics. It's okay to still have them aggregated, 
but for the for the subcomponents, you still want to have the low level metrics we need, because then we need because this is what our algorithms need to be able to figure out what's actually going on. All right? Postgres does this pretty well. Secret Server does this doesn't have this problem as well. Um, this, this, this is the most blatant example. All right, the next thing is that we want to uh, expose the right information about the, about the actions we want, to, we, want to, we want to deploy. Again, the basic idea is that we can pre-compute a bunch of actions ahead of time. Like, here's all the indexes I think I want to build, and then prune them down to be ones that actually matter to us. And then we want to make sure we expose this right information to the tuning algorithms so that they don't consider, you know, again, bad configurations and they reduce the number of choices they have to make. So I'm going to look at two examples, uh, how to deal with configuration ops and then dependencies between actions. So the most important thing, the most obvious glaring issue we found when we were trying to do automated tuning in, in an, in, with AutoTune, which is another system we were building, is that, again, these systems are designed for humans to manage. So they'll have a bunch of knobs and they'll let anybody tune them any way they want. But the problem is some of these knobs, again, require for a human to make a value judgment about whether tuning them a certain way is a good idea or not, right? Because uh, for some things that's obvious, like file paths, network addresses, and, and isolation levels, right? For these things, like, like if I don't set these correctly, then the system just doesn't boot, or I can't talk to it, right? For other things, though, like durability and isolation levels, these are a bit more nuanced. Um, and the problem would be that if you let some kind of algorithm tune these things, it's always going to choose, it may, may end up choosing something that may not be the right thing for your company or organization. So say your vector function is throughput, or I want, I want my system to run as fast as possible, and you let it tune the durability, well, the algorithm is going to learn that turning S-Sync off makes things run faster, so it's always going to turn that off. But now you might end up losing data, right? And the, again, the algorithms don't know, they don't care, because that's a higher level thing, a human construct about losing data that we can't, we can't necessarily reason about. So essentially what happens is, the way this works is you need to have a little flag that says, you know, this is something that a machine cannot tune. This, this is only be tuned by humans. And that way we don't consider these in, in our models. The next thing is that we need hints about how to actually, for the knobs we can tune, how to actually tune them. So most obvious things are like min-max ranges, right? And if they're bound by a hardware resource, you may want to, you know, like a, the number of CPUs, you may want to limit it to just, you know, to that, that number rather than, you know, from 2 to the 32. You also want to have separate knobs to disable enable features, right? So a lot of times we see systems where they'll use 0 or negative 1 to mean turn a feature off, right? If you want, so one of them was like you, to turn off um, uh, how much data, you, if you want to limit how much data you can write to disk, there's a flag to go to, you, know, you can set the, to, to, to modify this. But if you set it to zero, then in terms of all disk writes, which is again turning off F sync, and then again everything's in memory, everything runs really fast, which may not be what you want. So you want a separate flag to enable, enable, enable disable the feature, have that be banned, by, banned from being tuned by the algorithms, and let humans reason about that. And then we have a reasonable space of things we, we, can, we can deal with here. Another issue that's, that's related to reducing the search base is non-uniform deltas. And I would say this is, this is what I think is the right idea. My student disagrees. Um, we, don't, we don't know the answer yet. Right? So say you have a configuration knob that can set the, the amount of memory to use for uh, some kind of cache. Right? And it's, a, it's an integer. It's a 32-bit integer. So I can set it from 0 to 2 to the 32. But we know that every single possible choice along that number line isn't always going to be, uh, they're, they're not always going to be dramatically different from each other, right? So if I have one terabyte of memory, setting my, my cache size from you know, 900 megabytes to 901 megabytes isn't, isn't a big difference, right? So what you really want to have is you want to have deltas to say how the knob can be tuned, incremented and decremented, and then this, the size of that, that decrement can change with different values for the knob. So when I only have from one kilobyte to one megabyte of memory, maybe I want to do increments of 10 kilobytes. But if I'm over in between one gig and, and, 10, and one terabyte, maybe I want to jump around by 10 gigs. And what this does, this reduces the, 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 the search space of the algorithms and allows them to find, you know, to converge more quickly if they're up in this range to an optimal solution, rather than sort of looking at you know, one byte increments each time. So in my opinion, I think this is the right way to do this. My student says, 
always have the same increment size and just have a multiplier that says how many, you, you just have it keep reimplying over and over again. Um, we, don't, we, don't know, we don't know the answer yet. All right, the last category of things I want to talk about is doing action engineering. And again, the idea here is that we want to, it's just how we're actually going to deploy the, the action. So the most important thing, if you don't remember anything from this lecture or anything from this class, uh, I would hope not from the class, but from this lecture, is that there should be nothing in the database system should require you to have to have downtime in order to, for, that, for that action to take effect. And that downtime could either be having to restart or just blocking all transactions while you make the change. Now, in some cases, like adding indexes, if you try to do it concurrently, at some point there'll be a small window where you may have to block things, but we're talking like milliseconds. Uh, when I say you know, blocking transactions I, and, and that, where the system's unavailable, I mean for like seconds, minutes, or hours. As far as we can, can think about, there's, I can't think of anything that requires the system to have to go down in order to take effect. The problem is, most systems don't do this. Uh, the commercial systems are slightly better than the open source guys, but a lot of systems will tell you, if you, if, you know, change some, some buffer pool size or some, some cache size, it will tell you, I'm not going to take effect until I restart the system. The reason why this sucks, the reason why this is bad, because now in our algorithms, we have to now consider the restart time in our, in our cost functions. Right? So if I say, well, I'm going to make this change, this change is going to make me run two times faster, but now I'm going to have to be down for 20 minutes while I play, apply that change. That requires a human to, to come in and say, yes, you can, it's okay for you to be down for 20 minutes. All right? And that's bad because, because the human is likely going to say no because you, know, you want to wait until you, you have some window like Sunday morning at 3 a.m. of when you want to apply all these changes. So if there's a bunch of changes you can't apply because you can only do it when you have a downtime window. Now you can only do so many things during the day. Right? Again, you're, you're not going to collect a lot of training data. So what makes this even harder, not, you know, more than just asking the human permission to, to, to go down, the time it's going to take for you to, to, to restart or to, 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 to complete the action and come back online can vary based on the state of the database and what action you're applying. So the example I always like to give is, is the, the configuration parameter, configuration knob for the not MySQL log file size. So if I set my, my original log file size is 5 gigabytes, and I set it to 10 gigabytes, I have to restart for another, in, order to, in order for that to take effect. But when I restart, it comes back up right away because it says, oh, my, lax, my max log file size is 10 gigs. I'm currently 5 gigs. We're good to go. And it comes back online. But if I'm 5 gigs and I set it to 1 gig, then I come back online and it starts compacting the log. And depending on the size of my, or, sorry, the, the speed of my disk, that can take minutes or, or even hours. So now I've got to build models that can try to figure out, oh, my state looks like this. I'm trying to apply this action. Here's how long it's going to take me to restart. And that's hard. That's just not, you know, more, more complication that we don't need. The next one is uh, it's, it's useful for when you both have an external controller managing the system as well as for an internal controller. But you basically want a, a pub-sub mechanism inside the data system to be able to keep track of when an action starts and when it completes. And we need this for when we record all that training data about the runtime metrics of what the system is actually doing to know that if we see a degradation in performance, it's because we're deploying an action like building an index and not because we're doing something bad. Right? So what makes this hard is that for some actions, although not many systems actually support this, but there's no, there's no reason you couldn't, some actions can actually be used by queries to speed things up before it's actually fully completed. So now how do you account for this in your models is, is a bit tricky. So like, for example, if I, if I say create an index, some queries could start actually start using that index before it's actually completed. I mean, you have to, do, you have to you know, make sure you don't have any false positive, false negatives, but you, there's no reason you couldn't check the index, see what the thing is, is, is there. If it's there, then you're done. If not, then you fall back to, to the sequential scan on the table. But now again, now like I'm, I'm getting a benefit of an action. I'm seeing an, uh, an improvement in my training data for an action before it's actually completed yet. And that, that, that's an example. We don't, know how, we don't know how to deal with that. All right, the last one that I'm really excited about, and what we're going to work over the summer, is 
The ability to leverage the fact that we are using replicas in high available configurations to collect more training data. So any database system with, that people care about, where people, you know, there's money on the line, it, they just don't have a single, uh, you know, single database machine and just assume everything goes well, right? There's always going to be replicas. There's always going to be, you know, things you could fail over in case that, that, that one machine goes down, right? I'm sure there's people are to care about, you have money on the line, whether they are deployed on one database, but you shouldn't do that. Um, so the idea here is that we want to be able to use the, those replicas that we normally, that we have anyway for high availability. We want to use them to explore different configurations by our machine learning components to now collect new training data to help us find new optimizations and new configurations that we can then deploy on, on the production machines or the, or the master machines, right? Of course, now this becomes very problematic because we don't want to slow down the, 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 the replicas because they're still there for backups. Uh, and then some other issues with, with, with uh, discrepancies between hardware. So this is, this is hard. We don't know how to do this yet. But let me, let me go through a, an example and you see a bunch of different problems that come up. Again, really simple setup, master-slave or master with two replicas, right? And then we have some self-driving managers. I think we're calling it the pilot in our system, all right? And this thing is trying out different actions on these different replicas, all right, that to see whether there's, you know, some index they should be building that, that, that would help things that then we want to push, push to the master, right? Again, so if we find a better configuration, we can then push it to the front end. So the first problem is uh, we want to make sure that whatever we're trying out here doesn't cause the replicas to fall too far behind because, again, if I'm trying, if I try out a configuration on a replica that makes me run 5x slower and now I can't keep up with the master, the master all of a sudden dies and now I have to spend, you know, five hours to go replay the log and get me back up where I should be. And right? then that defeats the purpose of having, having a, a replica as a standby. Then we, right, and then we also need to keep track of like, if I apply the change, how long should I wait before applying another change, right? That's more on the, on the learning side. Um, but there's a whole bunch of decisions about how we actually apply these actions on the replica and learn from them that we don't know how to deal with yet. Now the next issue is that how do we deal with getting changes from the master to the replicas? So the application server will send all the reads and writes to the master, right? Assume you know, this, this is a single master setup. And then traditionally what happens is the master then just sends the writes to the replicas. And this can either be the SQL statements or the actual physical log, the write-ahead log. And these guys are, are essentially always in replay or recovery mode. We're just replaying whatever comes over the wire and then that's how they're trailing along with the master. So now the problem is, right, so the first question is what should the log be? Should it be SQL statements or physical log? So if it's the if it's SQL statements, then you, it's actually going to run through the whole the you know query execution pipeline. So as I'm collecting all the runtime metrics for the different parts of the system, the, all those parts will get tickled or get, get exercised. So I'll have training data for those different parts. But if, I, if I'm just replaying the physical log, then I'm bypassing the execution engine. I'm bypassing the query optimizer and the parser and all that you know high level parts, and I'm just applying the changes directly on the SQL table or the data tables. So now, how am I going to collect any training data for, for, you know, for those parts of the system? The other issue is that I'm only also only sending over the uh, right, so the component models, are, that's what we're collecting here. But I'm also only sending over the writes. Right? All the reads are going here. These guys are only seeing writes. So now the issue is going to be, if I'm only seeing the writes, and these guys can start making decisions about how to improve the write workload, which is because that's the only thing they're seeing. So there may be some important queries that we're doing over here, a lot of reads that need a certain indexes that, that the right guy, the right queries never touch. These guys will say, well, you don't need those read query, read indexes. We don't see any read queries and go ahead and drop them. So you could try to fix this by now sending some, some reads over from the master to the replica. That, that, that is a common setup. People do this. But now the problem is like, again, if I'm trying out different configurations, before I was just doing the writes, and so maybe I could I could try different configurations and I wouldn't fall too far behind. But now I'm also doing reads, right? And now if I have again, if I have a bad setup, a bad configuration, I may get you know too far behind and I have to crash this thing and restart, and then this thing dies and and I'm screwed. All right. So then the last problem we have is 
the, you know, we're, we're going to collect all this training data on these replicas. We're going to train these component models, you know, say how the system is going to behave according to, you know, the actions we apply. And then I want to be able to select, you know, actions that help me on this machine and have them apply to help me on this machine. But the problem here is that the hardware configuration could be different between the master and the replicas, right? You know, I could be running on, if, I, if, if I'm running on premise, you know, this could be running on uh, machines I procured this year, but these are running on a slightly older machines. So now the, maybe the disk speed, the amount of memory that I have available to me is different. But even if I'm running in the cloud, right, and I have the same instance type on Amazon EC2, we've seen in our, in our own studies, like the same instance type can have quite a bit of variation in the performance you get because it depends on who else is running on the same machine as you are, right? So, you know, on this machine here, the, he's, the, he's the only, this is the only tenant that's actually doing work, and so it, it runs pretty well. But then this guy here is running on a machine where somebody else is doing Bitcoin mining, right? And that's chewing up the CPU and, and, and you're contending for resources. So this one's going to end up performing slower. So I may end up making decisions for, on this machine, assuming my hardware is going to run slow, that helps me on slower, on, you know, in slower instances, that may actually be a bad choice over here on the faster one. We don't, we don't know how to deal with that yet either. So again, so, so to sort of put this all in perspective, some of the things you guys are working on in the class, there's a team working on uh, you know, logging and recovery and checkpoints. That's this piece here that we then feed it to the replicas, right, to replay and instantiate the database changes over here, but then while we're also doing, uh, you know, exploration in our models to, to collect training data. Okay, so hopefully again, I, I want to convey that the, for a self-driving database, it's, 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 you just can't take Postgres or MySQL or pick your favorite database system and just say, all right, we're going to put some machine learning crap inside of it and it's going to work. It's not. We tried it. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff you have to do that's different than how people normally build these systems uh, in order to expose the right information, the right controls into you know, some, some kind of you know, machine learning components to try to figure these things out. So... You may have seen also that Oracle announced that they have a self-driving database management system. So this came out in September 2017, where they said they had the world's first self-driving database, completely autonomous, right? No human labor, half the cost, blah, 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 blah. So I was slightly miffed about this because this came out in September 2017, but our paper on self-driving databases came out in 2017, uh, even though they're claiming they're the first, although our, our thing died, so it's dead. It's not here anymore, but... They didn't cite us, and Larry Ellison got on stage and said, uh, you know, Oracle self-driving database is the most important thing the Oracle Corporation has been working on in the last 20 years. A little shout out would have been nice, uh, but he didn't do that, but that's okay. So let's actually look what, what they're doing and see whether it's actually truly self-driving. So for self, their self-driving database, at least in the current incarnation, uh, it might have changed as of, of, of you know, late 2018, but I don't think it has. Um, they're claiming that it supports the f following five things. Automatic patching, index rec indexing, recovery, scaling, query tuning. So automatic patching is, is actually a big deal. The idea here is that you can apply security updates to the binary without having to restart the entire database system. That's a good one. Right? That, that's, it's, it's definitely you want to do this. Uh, I wouldn't say that's autonomous, right? It's sort of like something you just, you just want to do. I mean, it's, it's not easy, right? There's a lot of engineering work they had to do to make, that, make it work, but I wouldn't call that being autonomous. The ones that actually look most relevant to us are these three here, indexing, recovery, and scaling. Well, these are just all the same things I talked about in the very beginning from the sort of self-tuning tuning world. And my understanding from looking at the marketing literature and talking to some people that work at Oracle, these are just running Oracle's versions of the tools they developed 10, 15 years ago that you run on-premise as recommendation tools for, for D human DBAs. They're just not running that for you automatically in a managed environment. So it's like equivalent to, you know, the, it's, it's not this simple, but it'd be almost like if the recommendation have a GUI and then it would say, hey, do you want to build this index? And you click yes as a human on, with the mouse. They're just clicking yes for you to do, to do, to do these things. Um, so the problems that I talked about before, where these are only reactionary measures, they're only solving problems in the past because they're, they're only looking at workload traces and they can't transfer anything from what they learn about one database to apply to another database, 
uh, these all still apply. And so as such, I don't think this is actually truly autonomous or self-driving, right? It's a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solid piece of engineering that solves a real problem, but it, I, again, as I'm defining self-driving, whether or not I'm allowed to do that, who cares, right? I would say this is not self-driving. All right, the last one is that they're doing automatic query tuning as well. So this is another important aspect of, of database management that humans spend a lot of time on, which we, re we really didn't discuss. Um, and again, it's what we talked about before. We, we, we said that uh, the query shows up, I run it through my optimizer, the optimizer says, here's, here's the best plan I can, I can find. I then run it, I then see whether, if, if, if the estimations that my cost model made about what the data looked like versus what I'm seeing on the real data, if they start to vary, then I can go back and ask for a new query plan. So as I said, this, you know, this is not new, it's not unique to Oracle. SQL Server uh, 2017 added this adaptive query optimization feature. We've already talked about how IBM had something in the early 2000s as well. Can anybody think of another system that does something very similar to this that we talked about on the first, day of class, the first time we talked about uh, query optimizers? What was that early, the earliest database system I, that, that I talked about we're doing, you know, sort of query optimizing for, on a per query basis or per tuple basis? It's ingress, right? Ingress is essentially, it's at a high level doing the same thing, right? It's taking your giant query, decomposing it into these single tuple or single table queries, and then it runs the optimizer on that. So it's essentially doing the sort of the same thing where it's ad adapting the query plan on the fly as it goes, rather than sort of generating it all at once and then seeing whether that matches up. So at a high level, this looks the same, you know, it's very similar to this. So again, this is, the main takeaway is that automatic query tuning is not unique to, to Oracle. A bunch of other systems are, are you know, have, have tried this in the past. But the one, again, the, the, the main thing is these guys here, the middle ones, and I would say that, again, because of these deficiencies in the approaches, uh, it's not, it's not self-driving. Okay? Oh, uh, slides. All right, well, you, I'll, the next slide has, it's missing this, but whatever. I'll, I'll talk through it. All right, so the, so my research has been about the sort of self-driving data system taking a holistic view about the, how to manage the entire system. And the, the, the high level goal is that we, we, can, we, we, can, we can remove the need for humans to, to sort of babysit and maintain the software. Um, and, and obviously machine learning is the, is the way we're, uh, we're going to make this work. The current trend in research now, uh, which was more common, more prevalent, is to replace the existing components of, of systems with what are called learned components or machine learning models that can, can provide some kind of functionality that human engineered data structures or algorithms are, are doing now. So the most obvious one would be the, the optimizer cost model. I talked about all last class how error prone it is, all these assumptions, assumptions we make uh, in, in the algorithms to you know, estimate the cardinality and selectivity of these predicates. We make them because it simplifies the problem for us. So instead of having you know, maybe histograms or those sketches to approximate the cardinality of, of a scan, what if we build a deep net to, that could figure this out? You also see this in compression algorithms, data structures. We have, a, we have a paper in a workshop this year doing scheduling policies for transactions. And the idea here is that rather than having a human design by hand the algorithm to use for making decisions inside the data system for its runtime components, I can train, train a model that can make better decisions on a per application basis. So the, 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 the term of, that people use, these are called learned components. So I, sh I would have had an example of, of one of them, but that's, but that's fine. But the, the histogram is the most easiest one to, to, to understand, right? A histogram is basically an approximation function to say, for a given predicate, here's the, the number of tuples that a match. So rather than having you know, some formula to try to derive that information from the histogram, I can train a deep net that, that'll map some predicate to, to, to some, some cardinality value. In my opinion, I think this is very interesting. The early work 
is that basically the early work is, is essentially shows that you can do you know, slightly better than what the human engineered data structures can do or the human engineered implementations can do. Where I think it's really going to go, which can be really exciting, is the ability to come up with weird and obscure correlations and uh, dependencies between different input features that humans just haven't even thought about. You can throw, throw so much training data at these things and just start spitting out answers that like no human would ever have thought to, to allow you to do way better than you know, any of these human engineered data structures. That's where I think things are, are going to go in the future. Um, the tricky thing of those, I don't foresee these, these learned components being added anytime soon to any major database system in any sort of significant way uh, just because the, the explainability is not there yet. So you, you don't have an easy way to, to understand why these things are making certain decisions, which for humans, that, that matters a lot. Um, and I, I don't think people have really reason about how to deal with the situation where if shit goes bad, how bad does it actually get and what do you actually do? Like if you train some model on some garbage data and it starts giving you garbage results, then then, then feed back into your own garbage model, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, that's going to be a big problem as well. So I think what will happen is, I, I don't want to estimate how long it's going to be, but I think what will happen is that the we'll still have the human engineered components, but then they'll bring in piece by piece the learned components and they sort of work in tandem with each other. And eventually once we get to the point where people are confident that the learned components can, can supplant the, the engineered ones, then, then they'll, they'll overtake them. But I, you know, I, I don't see that happening this year. The papers are just coming out in you know, Sigma and VLDB and, and other, and other you know, conferences about one by one how to build machine learning models for these different parts, right? for, for these different things here. But no one's really sort of, sort of figured out this, this sort of long-term maintenance or sustainability problem. Okay, so to finish up, the, I'm excited about this. Like this is what I'm sort of staking my career on. Like this is why we ended up having to build a database system from scratch. Uh, other than being fun, but I think like having to try to automate it as much as possible is a, is a, a daunting challenge and we'll see whether we, you can get there. Um, I remember actually one of the reviews I had for a, a grant proposal for the National Science Foundation, this is from two or three years ago, uh, one of the, I got, the, the grant got rejected. It got later accepted, but that's fine. Uh, but the, one of the reviewers were like, said, you can't build a data system in academia and you can't automate everything that we want to automate. And so the fact they told us we couldn't do that makes me really want to do both of those things and that's why we're doing it. Um, so I think in the next 10 years, we'll have what I'll say is a level five self-driving data management system. That I think that like the, the field is progressing uh, fast enough and that, that we'll be able to just, again, you just give the system your credit card and it'll just go off and do its own thing. The main takeaway that I, want, that I want you guys to get from you know, today's lecture and the paper, whether you go off and build databases in the future or, or, or some other kind of system, you should really think about anytime you're adding a feature, not how is this, you know, this going to be controlled by a human or managed by a human, really think about how it's going to be managed by a machine. Right, configuration knobs right now, the, they're basically a, a, a stopgap solution for engineers where they say, well, I don't really know what this thing should be, so I'll just make it a knob, I'll choose you know, a decent default, and, hope, and then someone who knows what they're doing later on will come, up, come and set it for me. You can't assume that's gonna happen, and you wanna make sure that you make whatever algorithm is gonna tune it for you automatically, you wanna make their, their job easier. And so that, that means doing a bunch of things that we talked about today, exposing the right controls, exposing the metadata and low-level metrics um, in, a, in a meaningful uh, and meaningful way. Okay? All right, so that's it for the, for the semester. Again, I, I will post the, uh, the final exam. I'll send, send the PDF out on Piazza tonight. And then please do come on uh, Wednesday for the, uh, for the guest lecture from, from, from the SAP HANA developer or engineer. I'll also send out a, a, a notice on Piazza that if you want to meet with him on one on one about you know, internships or jobs on uh, on Tuesday morning, or sorry Thursday morning, uh, we'll we'll have a sign up sheet for that as well. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, good luck with your finals and other classes, and I'll I'll see you Wednesday. Take
Yeah. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.